This is Charlotte Talks, I'm Mike Collins. Despite what most of us view as progress in the struggle for civil rights since the 1960s, despite Charlotte's former role as the poster child for the racial integration of our public schools, we still remain a segregated society. Here and around the nation, schools have re resegregated, and where we live remains fundamentally segregated. The two go hand in hand, and the societal problems this fact of life causes are persistent and pernicious. Continuing segregation of neighborhoods leads to segregation of communities, and that leads to lack of opportunity, lack of upward mobility, and a fundamental unfairness. Many view this as a moral problem, and it is, but it is also one with a foundation in rules and regulations. Richard Rothstein has spent years researching the history of segregation, detailing factors that have prolonged it to this day, and points the finger directly at local, state, and federal policies that didn't just ignore discriminatory practices in housing, but promoted them. The result has been devastating for generations of African Americans. Charlotte is involved in a community read of Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, and a little later in the program we'll meet some of the folks involved to see how they are applying what they've learned to the crisis we face in Charlotte with regard to affordable housing, among other challenges. But first, we welcome Richard Rothstein. He is currently a senior fellow at the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at the University of California at Berkeley and a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute as well as being a senior fellow at the Third Good Marshall Institute of of the NAACP. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Nice to have you with us. And by the way, he'll be here in person next Monday, uh, January 28th at 7 o'clock at the First Baptist Church West to talk about the book and also to sign the book, which we'll be talking about this hour. As you travel around the country doing these discussions about your book and your book tour as well, and, 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 and just talking about your research, how many people are surprised by the history of housing discrimination and its impact on African Americans, and on the, in particular, and on the country as a whole? How many people don't know anything about this? Well, uh, almost everybody is surprised, but I was surprised too when I did this research. Almost everybody, myself included, has adopted the myth that we have de facto segregation, segregation that happens sort of by accident because of private prejudice or private activity of real estate agents or banks or maybe people liking to live with each other of the same race. We all think uh, it's different from the forms of segregation that we abolished in the 20th century, uh, state-sponsored segregation and schools and colleges and uh, uh, public facilities and interstate transportation and so on. We think residential segregation is different. It happened by accident. We have this myth. We call it de facto segregation. And the subtitle of my book, uh, The Color of Law, is a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. Um, so it's not just that many people I speak to are surprised. I'm surprised. I was surprised when I did the research. And most people are surprised because we've all forgotten that the residential segregation in every metropolitan area in this country was created, supported, reinforced, and perpetuated by federal, state, and local government on an explicitly racial basis. Uh, the residential boundaries in our areas today, in our cities today, and metropolitan areas, is as much a civil rights violation, created as much in violation of the Constitution, as any of the other forms of segregation we adopted. Let's, 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 and because... Go ahead. I'm go sorry. ahead. But no, well, well, I was saying, because, because uh, it, it's de facto segregation is myth. This was state-sponsored. We have an obligation under the Constitution to remedy it. So let's go back, because you said two things there in that last comment that might have pricked some people's ears, that it's unconstitutional and it's against uh, all of our civil rights laws. But didn't, weren't these many of these rules that led to African Americans not being able to purchase housing or live in certain neighborhoods, didn't they, many of them predate the Civil Rights Acts? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, but they don't predate the Constitution. They don't predate the Fifth and the Thirteenth and the Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution, which prohibit government from violating civil rights. Um, and uh, when, when government uh, created racially defined neighborhoods, excluded African Americans from the suburbs, concentrated them in urban areas with an explicit racial purpose, 
that was a violation of the Constitution. Uh, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment for the federal government to do it. It was a violation of the Fourteenth Amendment for state and local governments to do it. And that requires a remedy even before civil rights acts were passed, which uh, specified the mechanism through which the remedies would be uh, pursued. But once these civil rights laws came into place, equal housing opportunity, equal lending opportunity, those laws that, that govern uh, who advertising and can be uh, pointed to and who can buy a house where, and it's pretty much opened the doors, theoretically speaking, to, to everybody, why didn't those laws make a dent? Why do we still live in a fundamentally unchanged, segregated situation? Well, let me explain for a minute. Uh, 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 why that the civil rights laws were inadequate to remedy the situation. We had a Fair Housing Act passed in 1968. Uh, enforcement mechanisms weren't actually added until 1988, but it prohibits future discrimination in housing. But uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, the federal government created all white suburbs on an exclusively racial basis uh, and prohibited African Americans from moving into them. Uh, the most famous example is probably Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, Levitt, the builder, could never have assembled the capital to build 17,000 homes in one place, uh, for which he had no buyers. Uh, no bank would be crazy enough to lend him the money to do that. The only way Levittown and hundreds and hundreds of these suburbs all across the country as the nation suburbanized, the only way Levitt uh, could... Uh, get the capital to build this development was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, making an explicit commitment never to sell a home to an African American, even agreeing to a Federal Housing Administration requirement that he place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans, and on that basis, the federal government, the Federal Housing Administration, guaranteed his bank loans. Well, the white families who were subsidized uh, to move into suburbs, they could pay less uh, in their monthly housing costs in these all-white suburbs uh, with an FHA or VA mortgage that required no down payment than they were paying for rent in public housing, where many of them were living beforehand. Um, the white families that bought these homes, they were inexpensive at the time, about $100,000 in today's uh, inflation-adjusted money. Uh, any working-class family uh, can afford to buy a home. Um, for $100,000, especially with no down payment required. Um, over the next few generations, the, those homes gained in value, and the suburbs uh, around the country that were originally created by the FHA on an exclusively white basis, uh, homes there now sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars 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 $500,000. Mm -hmm. uh, the white families who bought these homes um, gained uh, appreciation, equity, uh, from the the growth and value of their homes. They use that equity, that wealth, to send their children to college, to uh, weather medical or, or temporary unemployment emergencies, to fund their retirements, to send and to uh, bequeath um, wealth to their own children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans who were required uh, to keep out of these suburbs, to remain renting in urban areas, gain none of that wealth. The result is that today, African-American incomes, although they're about 60%, 60% of white incomes on average, African-American wealth is only 10% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional housing policy that was practiced by the federal government. The homes in these suburbs, are, as I say, are now unaffordable. African-Americans or really to working class uh, uh, whites either, or unless they have down payment assistance from their parents. So simply prohibiting future discrimination, which the civil rights laws do, um, does nothing to remedy the creation of these all-white suburbs because the, they're now unaffordable. To African so gov Americans government, po government policies set by people, who were the actors back in the day when these policies were developed and enforced? Who did this? Why did the government have a horse in this race? Why did they care where people lived and they, and they didn't want African Americans and whites to mix? Why? Who who were the actors saying this is this is going to be the policy? Well, these were administration officials um, in beginning in the New Deal uh, in the Roosevelt administration. Um, but I want to emphasize these were not rogue bureaucrats. This was written federal policy. The the federal. Uh, policy manual, the Federal Housing Administration manual, 
that uh, uh, instructed appraisers of when to recommend suburban subdivisions for federal bank guarantees explicitly prohibited bank guarantees uh, for integrated developments. It even went so far as to prohibit bank guarantees for all white developments that might be located near where African Americans were living because it said, quote, it ran the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the manual said. So these weren't rogue bureaucrats. Uh, This was written federal policy. Why did the federal government follow this policy? Well, it followed this policy because we've never, as a country, uh, then or now, really dealt fully with the legacies of slavery, with the fact that we created a caste system after emancipation, or really after the end of Reconstruction, uh, when the Jim Crow era started. And this was the assumption of policymakers uh, throughout the government. It wasn't unanimous. It's not that they didn't know any better. There was plenty of opposition. In fact, in the Roosevelt administration, one of the main opponents was the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, president Roosevelt took the position that he couldn't uh, do anything controversial, like uh, combat uh, the racial segregation, because it would interfere with the support he needed for his economic programs, first in the 1930s, and then it would interfere with his uh, efforts to mobilize support for the war effort in the 1940s. Uh, So this was a a consistent policy of the federal government uh, throughout, and as I say, it's a a consequence of never really facing up to uh, the legacies of slavery in this country, to the caste system that we uh, created um, beginning really in the late 19th century and, and So the FHA said that, and this is a quote from their documents, incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. But this was written at mm-hmm. a time. This was written at a time when we were already living in the same communities. In many, in many cases, many cities around the country, uh, blacks and whites mixed together. They live together. I think you you write about uh, certain uh, manufacturing areas of the country where people uh, uh, who had to work in the factories wanted to had to live near the factories because they couldn't afford cars, so they would walk to the factories. And those were black people and white people. So there were traditions of people living together. Why? Why this sudden uh, statement that these are incompatible racial groups? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, as you as you say, working class families frequently live in integrated neighborhoods. Um, the great uh, African American poet novelist uh, Langston Hughes mm-hmm. uh, talked about how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. We don't think of downtown Cleveland today as being integrated but there were many integrated neighborhoods and urban areas at that time. I'm not suggesting that the entire country was integrated. Certainly it wasn't. But downtown areas were, for the reasons you say, workers of both races had to be able to walk to work or take short streetcar rides. And so there were integrated neighborhoods. Well, in Langston Hughes' neighborhood, um, which was downtown Cleveland, called the Central Neighborhood, where he said he went to high school where his best friend was Polish. He dated a Jewish girl. In that neighborhood in the 1930s, uh, the federal government demolished housing and built public housing for working-class families, uh, separate segregated housing, uh, one project for African Americans, another project for whites, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. So let's stop there for a second because I've got to take a break. And, and, and when we come back, we'll pick it up with this institution of different public housing projects, one for blacks, one for whites and the the reverberations of that policy that we're still feeling to this very day. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Atrium Animal Hospital and Wellness Center, providing holistic animal health care for 20 years, offering pet parents a strategy to achieve and maintain furry family vitality. AtriumAnimalHospital.com And the North Carolina 529 College Savings Plan, helping parents and grandparents save for college education with tax benefits and investment options. NC529.org CBD is the chemical found in cannabis. It's quickly becoming available across the country in a range of products, and its source, hemp, is also becoming, well, it's reaching cash crop status in North Carolina. So we're going to look at the pros and cons of CBD and the infrastructure springing up to make it available, and then a visit with author Matt De La Pena, who writes about a growing phenomenon in the United States, mixed status families. What are they? Find out tomorrow at 9.00. 
What did you make of that standoff between a group of high school boys and a Native American protester? Actually, do you know what to think? Some suggest we've reached a point where what you believe matters less than whose side you're on. All of it amplified by viral videos on social media. The protest in perspective. Next time on 1A. 1A from 10 to noon, right after Charlotte Talks. On 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News Source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking to Richard Rothstein, the author of The Color of Law. Richard Rothstein's coming to Charlotte next Monday to talk about his book and to uh, sign his book at 7 p.m. at the uh, First Baptist Church West. We'll have more information about that on our website at wfae.org slash Charlotte Talks. So we were talking before the break about how what we experience today in terms of segregated housing, even though we think this housing has, has come to be, be now in the light of the civil rights movement and the civil rights laws that followed, that people simply are living in black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods because that's where they want to live. That is not, in fact, the case. And these neighborhoods were established through a set of rules and regulations established in the early 20th century, mid-20th century, by the uh, federal government and state and local governments as well, at a time when many cities had already integrated because workers of all levels and all colors uh, had to walk to work and so they lived next door to each other so they could walk to work, suddenly the federal government decided we're going we're gonna to bulldoze some of these areas and we're going to put up public housing where we're going to build public housing for African Americans, and we're going to build separate public housing for white people. This took racially integrated neighborhoods and people who were accustomed to living next door to each other and separated them for decades. So does th- what kind of patterns and or expectations and or stereotypes has this set up in the minds of people around the country? Oh, let me turn you. I'm sorry, Mr. Rothstein. Um, go, go ahead. I had your uh, mic that's off. That's a very I'm sorry. good question because uh, <laughs> that is one of the consequences of this policy. I don't want to exaggerate it. It's not that the entire country was integrated uh, in the early 20th century, sure. but there were many integrated, uh, particularly downtown working class neighborhoods where the federal government built public housing to solve a housing shortage. This was not for poor people. Uh, people had to pay the full cost of the housing and their rent, of the public housing and their rent. There was no subsidies involved. But they were uh, both black and white workers living in these neighborhoods, and the government built separate projects um, uh, in in all over the country, even in places that today consider themselves uh, better than everybody else, uh, more progressive. Uh, uh, In my book, I talk about Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the area between Harvard and MIT was an integrated neighborhood, uh, about half white and half black, and the Public Works Administration demolished housing there and built separate projects for, for whites and blacks. Um, and this went on in many, many places. Well, a couple of uh, decades later, in about 1950, in the early 1950s, uh, the white projects uh, suddenly developed large numbers of vacancies because of the federal program I talked about before to get all whites out of the central cities and into the suburbs with this uh, subsidized FHA program. The black projects had long waiting lists. Uh, pretty soon, uh, even the most uh, bigoted public housing officials uh, couldn't sustain a situation where some projects in their cities were uh, empty and, and large vacancies and others had long waiting lists. So all projects uh, came to be uh, uh, open to African Americans. Uh, at about the same time, industry left the cities. It no longer had to be located near deep water ports or uh, near railroad stations to get parts and um, ship final products. It could move to suburbs and rural areas where uh, highways were being built and it could get parts and ship final products that way. The result was that the African Americans, who were now concentrated in urban areas without whites, uh, had less and less access to good jobs. Uh, they uh, became poorer and poorer. Public housing came to be subsidized. Uh, once it came to be subsidized, the um, Uh, Projects deteriorated because government stopped maintaining them, stopped investing in them. Uh, They became the kind of urban slums that we um, uh, associate with public housing today. Well, whites looked at these urban slums, 
And uh, not understanding the history, not understanding the policies that created these slums and that denied African Americans, who previously had incomes that in many cases were similar to whites and could have easily afforded to move to the same suburbs that whites were moving to, they didn't understand that the, the slum conditions were not the fault of the African Americans. And so they began to develop stereotypes or reinforce stereotypes uh, of African Americans as being slum dwellers. So these policies, which were certainly uh, supported by public opinion, bigoted public opinion on the part of, of many whites, also created that public opinion, opinion, created the stereotypes. So it was a vicious circle. It was the bigotry that forced government to, to follow the policies, and then government policies created the bigotry. Yeah, this is like a snowball going downhill. One one thing begets another, and, 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 and it just grows and grows over time. You build neighborhoods like Levittown. White people leave the city because they have this wonderful opportunity to buy a single-family home. Only they can buy that home because it's structured that way in federal housing and lending laws. Uh, black people remain in the city. Jobs move to the suburbs because that's where the people are. Uh, the, it allows the people in those suburbs to, to build and maintain wealth and build their middle class lives while black lives begin to dwindle and, and dip into poverty because the jobs are disappearing. People aren't taking care of that. And by people, I mean the landlords aren't taking care of the properties that they're living in. Despair mushrooms, poverty increases, uh, crime increases, neighborhoods decline and we create a permanent lower class. Why didn't anybody notice this while it was going on? People in power who set the policies, why didn't they notice this going on? Why didn't they attribute what was happening there to their own policies? Well, as I said earlier, I really don't have a good explanation for it, except that we've never dealt in this country. We never had truth and reconciliation to expose the consequences of slavery and uh, to uh, the way in which we established a caste system in this country after the end of Reconstruction. And this was a widespread assumption of normality on the part of public officials. As I indicated, it's not, it wasn't unanimous. People knew better. Yeah. They had alternatives. Um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, uh, was one of the people who was most outspoken about the the disadvantages, the dangers of this policy. There were others, and there were many who understood the dangers but didn't have the courage to speak up against the public opinion uh, to resist them. Uh, in my book, I talk about the, the president of the University of Chicago, who, uh, when he was president of the University of Chicago, his name was Robert Hutchins and from the late 1930s to the early 1950s, maintained a legal office in the office of the presidency of the University of Chicago, whose job it was to sue to have African Americans evicted from homes near the university uh, because he had organized, his office had organized agreements among homeowners in those neighborhoods never to sell a home to an African American. Well, later on he was interviewed and he said that he knew it was wrong but he didn't have the courage to resist the, the request of the trustees of the University of Chicago to, uh, uh, to resist this policy, to, to not implement this policy. And he says it wasn't one of the biggest mistakes he made. Uh, some of this could be unintended. Some, some of this could be unintended consequences by by our ancestors who put these policies in place, I suppose. And uh, and much of what we've been talking about, as you've mentioned, has disappeared into the mists of time. We simply don't understand how all this came to be. We just look at what is and think, well, it's always been that way, and it's that way for reasons that we have developed in our heads that are inaccurate. But people like, including uh, Ben Carson, who's the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development also doesn't seem to know what happened in the past. How do you explain things like that? It is clear today, all you have to do is pick up your book and read, uh, and other books like it, to, to, to figure this out. Why are there some people in power who still don't see this? Well, uh, you know, it's a common trope to say that there, are, that there are unintended consequences to policies to try to correct this. As you say, Ben Carson says that um, to try to correct these problems would be a form of social engineering uh, that has unintended consequences. Well, what he doesn't recognize is that it's not social engineering. It's an attempt to undo social engineering. 
And, of course, there are always unintended consequences to any policy that, that government implements, and it's the job of policymakers to carefully at the policies and try to avoid uh, consequences uh, as best they can that they don't intend. But there are unintended consequences to not acting as well. And the unintended consequences of not acting to address segregation are enormous. They are much greater than any possible unintended consequences of um, redressing this. Uh, because of the racial segregation that we've created, our government created in uh, every metropolitan area in this country, we have educational gaps between black students and white students that are a direct result of the concentration of the most economically disadvantaged minority students in single schools where they overwhelm the ability of schools to deal with their social and economic difficulties, whether it's poor health or stress from parental economic insecurity or homelessness. Uh, schools can't overcome that so long as children are concentrated Entire schools and entire classrooms are filled with children with these kinds of problems. It predicts uh, the health disparities between African Americans and whites, where African Americans have shorter life expectancies and greater rates of heart disease, in part attributable, in large part attributable, to the fact that they live in less healthy neighborhoods, more polluted neighborhoods, less access to healthy food. It certainly predicts the outrageous criminal justice system we have today, in which um, African Americans, young men, without hope, without access to jobs in the formal economy that pay decent wages, without access to schools with high achievement, um, are acting out in, in low-income neighborhoods, attracting the attention of the police, getting involved in violent confrontations with them, as we've seen in Ferguson, Baltimore, other places like that in recent years. Those things would not be happening were we not concentrating those men, the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods, and it also um, is threatening our democracy, this racial segregation that we've created, uh, the enormous political polarization that we have in this country, uh, which largely tracks racial lines, um, could not uh, exist if African Americans and whites, so many of them, weren't living so far from each other uh, that we have no ability to empathize with each other, to understand each other's life experiences, and to develop a common national identity. What we're talking so the unintended consequences of not dealing with this problem are enormous. What we're talking about with Richard Rothstein is all spelled out in his book, The Color of Law. That book was chosen to be a community read here in Charlotte, the purpose of which is to educate and engage all of us in this community to see how our housing challenges uh, could be viewed in a new and different light. And we're joined now by two of the people working toward that end. Dr. Ricky Woods is senior minister of First Baptist Church West. He was also a member of the Opportunity Task Force, which grew out of a, grew out of a, a survey uh, that showed that if you're born poor in Charlotte, you will die poor in Charlotte. He now serves on the County Manager's Committee studying improvement plans for pre-K services. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you, Mike. And Peter Kelly is here. He's a retired banking executive who now focuses his time as an advocate for affordable housing and social justice. He co-chairs the Myers Park United Methodist Affordable Housing Group and is a member of the Housing Justice Coalition and the One Mech Affordable Housing Group. You've been on this program before, so welcome back. Well, thank you. Good to see you. First of all, Dr. Woods, how did this book, The Color of Law, become a community read? Well, it started, Mike, uh, when I heard Rothstein on NPR a little over a year ago, and I introduced it to our church as a congregational book read uh, mm -hmm. this past summer. Uh, the interest from that congregational book read, I was able to engage other people in the community about what we were learning. And... Uh, partnered with MEC One and other community partners to introduce it as a community book read. You made Richard Rothstein a very happy man because you distributed 1,400 <laughs> of these books. Where did they go? Who's reading this book as part well, of Well, the books project? are going all over Charlotte. We distributed the uh, books in regional libraries mm -hmm. where persons could pick up one free as well as the Babies Ford Branch Library. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a number of uh, partners to join us uh, in this process. They are listed on the website. If you would go to colorlawclt.com, you can see a list of sponsors, both of uh, grassroots sponsors as well as some corporate sponsorship, as well as in an effort to get this information out to educate the community. As we've been talking, Peter Kelly, with Richard Rothstein, uh, it, it, 
Charlotte's been swirling through my head because of all the programs that we've, we've done on various subtopics of this topic without even knowing the genesis of where all of this started. How does this relate to Charlotte? Well, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it relates in the sense that this history happened here as well. So the most obvious example that happened recently or gotten a lot of publicity recently is the Brooklyn neighborhood that was part of the urban renewal in the 1960s. That second ward, which is where the government center in Marshall Park uh, is today. And that, at that point, government policy was it was good business sense to demolish those areas and re reuse that land for other purposes. It was written at the time that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to change the specter of downtown Charlotte. And what does that mean? Let's go back in time, because at that time, Brooklyn was a thriving African-American community. It had everything. It was self-sustaining. It had everything. Doctors, uh, uh, lawyers, businesses, churches. churches, a YMCA. It had everything. Uh, and, 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 and it wasn't that big. It's Second Ward. We know what Second Ward is. It's a, a, a Trade Street, uh, Tryon Street, Stonewall, and McDowell. That's Second Ward. Uh, why, why the need to bulldoze this entire community, displace hundreds of families, so that we could put up virtually nothing, if you look at what's there today. <laughs> Why did we do this? Well, I mean, it was caught up in the, the big movement of getting rid of public housing, and the fact that they... But that wasn't public housing, was it? No, but it okay. was perceived as being, in the Brooklyn neighborhood, you had mixed income. You had everybody from the wealthy do doctors and attorneys down to the relatively poor. Yeah. Those homes that the poor lived in were not well maintained. They were owned by others. They were degrading over time. So when they went in and focused on that aspect, which was a say 30% of the neighborhood was in fact declining pictures so that it looked just like everybody else wanted to talk about public housing, mm -hmm. they used that avenue to come back and say, hey, we need to make this better for the business. So these people that were displaced years ago, and, and some of them never really recovered from that. The Correct. community certainly never recovered because it was a community, and that community was dispersed uh, well, to the winds. Somewhere in the neighborhood of approximately 2,600 families and eight to 900 businesses uh, were lost, mm -hmm. displaced. Uh, and that displacement meant that those families could not pass on that wealth or the opportunity. And we only have a minute here in the segment, but it's, it occurs to me that this is happening in a different way today yes. because of gentrification. Yes. Uh, and a great example of that is what we've seen in the old Double Oaks neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, Double Oaks, which was an affordable housing area now, is the new Bright Walk. Uh, and more of those properties are getting redone and changed over. And the question now is, where are those people going? And where are they living? And, and can those people continue to afford to live in our community? It's Reverend Ricky Woods, who's the senior minister at First Baptist Church West. Uh, Peter Kelly is here is with social, a social justice advocate and co-chair of the Myers Park United Methodist Affordable Housing Group. Richard Rothstein is also still with us. We're going to come back and talk more about the findings in his book, The Color of Law, and how they apply to Charlotte, and specifically... How they apply to affordable housing, because that's an interest of the two guests in the studio specifically here, and we have a big problem with that here in Charlotte. We're coming right back at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Doctors Making House Calls, 105 primary care and specialty clinicians helping complex patients avoid unnecessary ER visits and hospitalizations. Positions available throughout North Carolina. Info at doctorsmakinghousecalls.com. A video of a white male, of white male teenagers surrounding Nathan Phillips, a member of the o Omaha tribe, went viral over the weekend, but longer videos released on Sunday sparked a conversation about the context in which the original video was released. Believing what we see, the Covington Catholic video and the competing narratives. Joshua Johnson and his guests on 1A will talk about that in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock. And a reminder that one of our guests today, Richard Rothstein, the author of The Color of Law, will be holding a book discussion and signing from 7 to 9 p.m. on Monday of next week, January 28th, at the First Baptist Church West. We're coming right back. Hey y'all, this is Tommy Tomlinson. On the new episode of Southbound, we talked to Janie Mines, 
the first black woman to attend the U.S. Naval Academy. She's written a new book about her experiences there and what they taught her about herself and about life. You can find this in every episode of Southbound on Apple Podcasts, NPR One, and WFAE.org. Support for Southbound comes from Southeast Radiation Oncology Group. Hey, Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, with Mr. Rothstein, who will be in town on Monday of next week. Uh, Dr., uh, Reverend Dr. Ricky Woods is here, First Baptist Church West uh, senior minister and one of the progenitors of the community read of Mr. Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, because it applies uh, to a lot of uh, problems that we face here in Charlotte. Peter Kelly, uh, co-chair of the Myers Park United Methodist Church Affordable Housing Group, is also with us. Charlotte knows we have opportunity problems. You're a former member of the Opportunity Task Force, Dr. Woods. We know we rank low on social capital, which predated the survey uh, that uh, that really got people very upset in Charlotte about lack of opportunity to rise above where you were born. Uh, we, we know we have a terrible problem with affordable housing, a shortage of it, even though we just passed $50 million in bonds and the uh, corporate community has stepped up with $70 million more. It's a, it, that's just, that, that scratches the surface of the need uh, in this. And much of the reasons for all of this are found in Mr. Rothstein's book. Are the answers found there, too? I don't know if the answers are necessarily found there, but I do think that there is a lot that we can learn from what is found there so that we don't repeat the same policy mistakes. Uh, what uh, Dr. Rothstein's book shows are the policy mistakes that were made that led to this difficulty. And we seem to be making those mistakes again. We saw with the urban renewal, mm -hmm. we just talked a little bit about what happened with Brooklyn. But we're also seeing it in the loss of public land that we have in this community that could be used to do more affordable housing projects and to provide opportunities for those who are at the low in the income, particularly if we make the land available. Uh, but as that land continues to get away from us, we're going to be losing those opportunities. We had uh, integrated schools here for mm -hmm. a long time in Charlotte due to court order busing to integrate the schools. Right. And when those court orders fell away, we resegregated. Uh, we're still in the process of that happening, but pretty much it has happened, and it's happened because of housing policy. If you want neighborhood schools, then you're going to resegregate because our neighborhoods are, are, are segregated. Uh, are we typical of the rest of America, or are we somehow different I think Charlotte? I think we're probably typical. I think we were different and was why people were coming to Charlotte to learn how Charlotte did it. There was wonderful examples, particularly with the Swan case and how busing got used. West Charlotte is a prime example of what became the kind of school and model school that others talked about of how this could work. And there were other examples in this community. And Charlotte was the envy of the country as an example of an urban integrated school system. Unfortunately, we had people that began to move into Charlotte that didn't know that history, didn't know that kind of experience, and they wanted neighborhood schools. I was here when that conversation began to take place. They sued to uh, stop uh, busing, if you will, and to come up with a neighborhood assignment. And we went from eight to 12 schools that were racial in balance now to almost 147. And the ac academic performance is reflecting it, and the academic despair among teachers is also reflected. And, and this racial segregation, Mr. Rothstein, uh, it, it plays a role, in, in the, as you mentioned, in the educational achievement gap. It plays a major role in the wealth gap. It has played a role in the increasing divide mm -hmm. in our country, not only between the races, but just between people. Uh, it, has, it, has in, uh, it has increased the tensions between uh, the African-American community and police. It has increased the number of food deserts. It, has, it has, uh, has led to a decline in the health of black communities here and around the country. And it's led to the resegregation of our schools. So would it be an overstatement, Mr. Rothstein, to say that Almost everything that ails us today is a result of this of these policies. Well, I think that would be an overstatement because we have many other problems in this country today besides racial segregation. But racial segregation is one of the major ones. Uh, we have enormous economic inequality. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have enormous economic inequality in this country, which needs to be addressed quite aside from our racial problems. <clears throat> 
uh, our, our uh, wages are, are not keeping up for uh, working class families in both races are not keeping up with uh, the cost of living. Um, the, the, there are many economic policies we're following, which redistribute wealth and income to the very richest people in society. All of these problems reinforce the problems that are created by racial segregation, and racial segregation reinforces the problems that are created by this economic inequality. So I wouldn't say that racial segregation is the only problem we face, uh, but it's a major one. It's a major contributing factor. So if regulation, and we've talked about this in the first two segments, if regulation got us into uh, this mess and this pattern of housing and uh, lack of economic opportunity, uh, can re-regulation uh, get us out of it? And if that's possible, is anybody working on it? And how urgent is the problem? Are you, are you asking me? Yes. Well, it's not re-regulation. It's different kinds of regulations. It's, it's remedies for the problems that the, the civil rights violations were created. We could, at the most extreme example, and, and we're not going to do any of these remedies, what you say, without a much greater public support. We, we need a, a new consensus, uh, just as we had in the civil rights movements of the, the 20th century, the 1960s, a consensus that this is an urgent problem that needs to be taken care of. And let me say that the civil rights movements of the 1960s didn't rely simply on historical uh, analysis and engaged in, in the protests and demonstrations and civil disobedience. People lost their lives. So we need a new civil rights movement to address this. Once we have that new civil rights movement, and if it uh, gains sufficient support, the remedies that we need to follow are fairly obvious. It's not hard to figure out what the policies are to redress this. We should, for example, be subsidizing African Americans to purchase homes in suburbs if they're qualified, um, suburbs that were, are now unaffordable to them, but that would have been affordable to them uh, had they been permitted to buy into them when whites were permitted to buy into them. We should have in urban areas inclusionary zoning, which uh, requires that when development is, is produced, uh, that a share of the units in any development are for low income, moderate income, and uh, market rate housing. Uh, th those are two policies uh, that we should follow. We, in suburbs, we should um, abolish and, and prohibit the kinds of zoning rules that restrict uh, whole communities. Uh, segregated white communities to single-family homes on large lot sizes that effectively lock in the segregation that was unconstitutionally created in the, in the 20th century. Uh, so those are a few of the policies we could we're, try we're trying to do some of this, Peter Kelly, here in Charlotte with housing policy, although I don't think we are permitted necessarily by law to write that into the code, we can encourage developers to do Correct. things that way, but we can't say you must do it that way. But he's saying, Mr. Rothstein is saying, we have to do this. It has to be written into the law. Is there any political appetite at the state level or the, or the federal level to do that? There's certainly not. I don't think there's the energy to do that at either the state or the federal level. Why not, given the problems that we can clearly see that have been produced by decades of discrimination? Well, I think there's still a lot more relearning of history that must have taken place for a larger part of the community, and that's really what we're trying to strive for with the book read. Right. This is an impetus to start having dialogue. We need to have a dialogue to understand more about how this did happen, yeah. the intentionality of it, and what practices we may take going forward. We, the, the items he mentioned are possible solutions, but they're probably impossible politically. There are other methods that we are currently have, like low-income housing tax credits. If the federal government made a decision to increase the amount of funding for that, that would increase the amount of building capable mm -hmm. in Charlotte. So there's a limit on how much that dollar amount is, and that limits the number of deals that could be financed. There are policies that the city is now looking at for the um, zoning issues and the overall Charlotte master plan that would enable us to look at neighborhoods that are gentrifying and come up with policies some other cities are beginning to look at. Yeah. So how do you start to put your policies in place to acknowledge that gentrification 
is forced displacement. That, that is one of the, th the thrusts of this community read. Uh, I think it's affordable housing and gentrification. And, and people have asked about the name of the book, so let me give the name of the book again. It's called The Color of Law. It's by P Richard Rothstein, one of our guests this morning. But uh, we are witnessing here in Charlotte the disappearance of what you called NOAA, Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. And it's disappearing because of gentrification. Uh, how do you stop that? How do you slow that? That's a great question. I would have to defer to Pete on that when he knows a little bit more about that. But we're seeing uh, the impacts in terms of how we're losing opportunities uh, because of gentrification. Uh, Pete. Okay. Well, the good news is that the Charlotte housing framework that was passed last August by the city council envisioned potential solutions to going after naturally occurring affordable housing by allowing the city or the public and or private money to join together to purchase those properties and to retain their affordability right. rather than having them being demolished and displacing the current residents. So there are, are ways to go in and purchase that property, make improvements because oftentimes they're not maintained to the current standards and do that financially in reasonable ways. So it's more about speed to market, understanding where it is. And NOAAs are all over Charlotte. They're not just in the poor neighborhoods. Mm. And so you have to understand where you're trying to save the homes. One of the things that Richard Rothstein talks about in his book is how at every step of the way, whenever uh, we, policy has stepped in to reverse or try to reverse the discrim discrimination and the segregated housing that we now have because of policy, People have stepped in with workarounds almost every yes. single time. Although redlining, which is the practice of saying you can only buy or sell to certain people, and those people are usually white, uh, although that practice has been outlawed, uh, Justin Perry, writing this week in the Charlotte Observer, referred to real estate agents when asked about schools today, right now, even as we speak. They sometimes advise newcomers to our city, well, Looking for a good school, you either move north or you go south or you go private. Mm -hmm. uh, that ties schools and school performance to neighborhoods. It's a reference to where the more affluent communities are and to where the poorer and African-American people are not. Clearly, this perpetuates discrimination, and clearly this is not just a problem in Charlotte. Is it, Mr. Rothstein? No, it's not. This is the same thing that's happening all over the country. But uh, as I said, the, the, the policies to remedy this are fairly obvious. Um, you, know, you mentioned the low-income housing tax credit. Uh, this is a subsidy that's given to developers to build housing that's affordable to low-income families. But the federal regulation, the Treasury Department regulation that sets forth this program, places a priority on building low-income housing in already low-income neighborhoods, reinforcing segregation. That regulation would be a very easy thing to modify so that not all, but at least more housing for low-income families was built in integrated neighborhoods. But then you're going to have people screaming bloody murder about lower property values. How do you overcome that? Well, we need to understand the enormous consequences, as I said before, of the uh, existing segregation that we have in the society, the danger it threatens, it, it has to our democracy. Most of our social problems, our most serious social problems, are uh, attributable to racial segregation, and we need greater public understanding. Because, well, but because this, this, this goes back to, this goes back to uh, William Levitt, who you referred to earlier in the program, who's the developer of the very first suburban neighborhood in America, Levittown, uh, and he said, uh, uh, back in the 1950s, he was quoted as saying, as a Jew, I have no room in my mind or heart for racial prejudice, but I have come to know that if we sell one house to a Negro family, then 90 or 95 percent of our white customers will not buy into the community. This is their attitude, not ours. As a company, our position is simply this. We can solve a housing problem or we can try to solve a racial problem, but we cannot combine the two. That was said, in the, I believe, in the summer of 1950. I would think you could hear something like that. That was like other that. nonsense. Okay. Uh, let me say, that was other nonsense on Levitt's part. First of all, he was a bigot, and uh, he, he himself uh, moved out of a, a neighborhood in Brooklyn 
uh, as soon as African Americans started moving in, mm -hmm. there was nothing. His property values hadn't declined. Uh, he promoted that. Secondly, the housing shortage at the time he developed Levittown was so enormous that if he had, the federal government had required him, even as a bigot, it had required him as a condition of gaining his um, uh, federal guarantee for bank loans to sell on a non-discriminatory basis. There may have been some bigoted white families who wouldn't have bought into an integrated development, but the housing shortage was so enormous that for everyone who declined, there were 10 waiting in line to take its place. So that whether he was bigoted or not, it was the federal government that imposed the policy of segregation. And if he wanted to build a development and the government had followed its constitutional responsibilities and told him that he couldn't discriminate, he would have had to sell on a non-discriminatory yeah. basis and, and the whole country uh, would look very different today. Although I would bet you that some of that attitude exists today on the, on, on the part of a lot of Peter, people, Peter Kelly, uh, and that would seem to me would be, those people could be enlightened by joining your community read of this book. That's the hope, <laughs> is that we get people to understand if you actually do the facts and understand things like scattered, scattered site housing, which was started to mitigate the issue of concentrated poverty in neighborhoods, that if you actually put a affordable housing development into a wealthier neighborhood, it does not change the property and value. And aside from this upcoming Monday, and I have 20 seconds here, how many other opportunities will there be for people to read and discuss? This well, we'll, we'll be continuing to do work on this uh, after the book read on the 28th and after Richard. So if people will check the website and uh, listen out for more opportunities to be engaged. That's uh, Dr. Ricky Woods, Senior Minister of the First Baptist Church West. Peter Kelly here from the uh, Myers Park United Methodist Affordable Housing Group. And Richard Rothstein, author of The Color of Law, one of the, the book in the community read that we're undergoing right now. Thank you all for the hour. Charlotte.